Rob Ho there. This is the Port Eglinton area of Glasgow. An area that kind of feels pretty derelict. Like some, at least one pretty nice building there, covered with graffiti and uh, unoccupied and probably in danger of being lost at some point. It's a mixture of dereliction and the industry or business. Um, and of course you do have to wonder where the name uh, comes from. Port Eglinton. Got to be a clue in there somewhere. This is Paisley Canal Railway Station. A pretty basic and perhaps typical station for um, suburban areas of, uh, of Glasgow. It's not what you might term a proper station. The, the proper station used to be on the other side of Causeway Side Road there, but that section of the line was closed, I think, in the 1980s. And you know, what you've got here is just, um, I don't think passengers are meant to feel comfortable here. Instead of a proper um, station or a ticket office, there's just a plastic box plonked on the platform with a kind of sloping bench that you're meant to try and sit on without sliding off. No toilet facilities. Typical sort of stuff really. But... <sighs> I'm not here to talk about railways, or moan about railways, or am I? Paisley Canal Railway Station. So where's the canal? Well, it actually used to be just there, where the railway line is now. Because this railway line was um, built over the canal. The canal was filled in, I think it was the um, 1880s, something like that. The railway line was built between here and, uh, well, from Glasgow and, and further on, in fact, uh, making good use of the canal's route that kind of cut its way through the, the countryside. Um, the rail line didn't always exactly follow the route of the canal. Sometimes it kind of veered off a wee bit for good reasons, I'm sure, but in most cases it did. Now the canal here, I think we'll call it the Glasgow, Paisley and Ardrossan Canal, was constructed around about the beginning of the 19th century and the idea was to allow for the passage of goods backwards and forwards, probably coal from the, the west towards Glasgow, goods from Glasgow towards the west, where you had a port at Ardrossan. Um, it wasn't really manageable to kind of a, ship your goods from Glasgow down the River Clyde at that stage, early 19th century. The river was just too narrow. It wasn't navigable and possible to shift goods on it. And most goods between um, Glasgow and the West Coast were having to be shipped via road between Glasgow and Port Glasgow. Port Glasgow being Glasgow's port at one time, then put on a ship and bound for wherever. But unfortunately, this canal, the, the, the main financial backer, I think it was the 12th um, Duke of Eglinton, whose name lives on in the area of Glasgow called Port Eglinton. He died and uh, the money kind of fizzled out and uh, the section between Johnson and Ardrossan was never actually built. So this canal was really just uh, the, the Glasgow Paisley and, and Johnson Canal. Because railways started to kind of take over from canals and become more popular for, for leisure and other sort of reasons, um, this canal um, was eventually filled in, as I say, and the railway line built over the top of it. Um, 
The section of the railway line, railway line beyond here uh, was shut, I think, in the 1980s. The really good railway station on the other side of Causeway Side Road was also shut and uh, this station was built. And the National um, Cycle Network now has a route that follows um, this section of the, the old railway line, which in turn follows the, the course of what used to be the canal. So today what we're going to do is we'll sort of follow just a little bit of it from here um, and we'll see if we can find any remnants or any kind of little clues that there was ever a canal here. The canal was in operation between 1810 and around 1881 before being filled in prior to the laying of railway tracks. I imagine it was probably used to ship coal to Glasgow, but it's hard to know what, if anything, was being shipped out of Glasgow given that the canal didn't go to Ardrossan as originally intended. Certainly it was used for leisure. In 1814, for example, 35,000 passengers paid to be slowly transported on the still waters, clearly not put off by a disaster just a few years earlier when a barge capsized at Paisley, killing 85 people. This 1850s map shows the Glasgow end of the canal at Port Eglinton at a time when the canal was still in use. All thoughts of extending the canal to Adrossan were dead and buried by this stage, but still it bore the name the Glasgow, Paisley and Adrossan Canal. Perhaps they always hoped that one day it would be extended. This image shows Port Eglinton in 1835. As previously mentioned, the railway didn't always follow the course of the canal exactly. At times, for various reasons, it followed a slightly different course. This side-by-side -side image shows an 1890s map on the left and a modern satellite image on the right. You can see the course of the old canal between the railway line and the white cart water. On the modern map you can still see a vague outline of where the canal once was. Here we have a similar side-by-side -side view, and again you can clearly see that the rail lines follow a different route to the canal, with its course still partially visible today. This 1858 map shows the course of the canal at Paisley, and you can clearly see the basin where in 1810 85 passengers lost their lives. Well, that's the old station on the other side of the road there. That's what you call a station, you know, that's how things used to be built properly. Not like that plastic box that is plopped on the platform of Paisley Canal's modern railway station. This would have had a waiting room, toilets, parcel moving facilities, any number of things. In the waiting room there would pro probably also have been a real fire where the station master would have attended the fire, kept it lit, and so that the passengers waiting on their train would have been warm. The good old days. <laughs>
This is a little hidden remnant of the canal, little slightly humpy bridge which went over the canal. I'd, I'd I think there probably is still a little bit of water down there but nowhere near what it would have been like long ago. This is called Tannehill's Bridge, named after the poet Robert Tannehill who uh, died in a watery culvert not far from here. It was said that he committed suicide. Not sure how they would have come to that conclusion but um, yeah. He's actually buried in a, a cemetery, an overgrown cemetery just off the, the, the cycle way in fact. Um, so um, Let's just sort of carry on here. I had to leave the cycle way there. I, I sensed instinctively that I'd gone too far. I got a bit, a bit lost. I had to kind of backtrack and start asking people, um, which is always a bit of a bummer when you're a great adventurer. But um, we'll carry on this way and we'll see if there's any um, anything else left of this canal. Well, you know, when wandering around this area, um, and I, I, I get kind of lost there, it's just a sprawling housing scheme. It's very hard to appreciate or even believe that right here was once one of the largest mills in the world, the Fergus Lee Thread Mill. It was a complex of huge mill buildings occupying quite a large area right beside the canal and um, from here there is actually, this is where you can actually start to see the, the remains of the canal, little kind of water channel there and it starts to get wider into a kind of large basin which you can still see and that's all that is left of the waterway. Um, the only thing left of the Fergus Lee Thread Mill is, this is one of the gatehouses just behind me, it's now housing and it's good to see that it's still uh, there are still here and the only other thing is um, some words carved on stone at the entrance to the housing estate by a by groundabout spelling out the name uh, Fergus Lee Threadmill original uh, bits of stone and carving so sad to see that it's all gone you know I, I find it hard to believe 
I think the mill started up in the early 19th century and probably went on until, I can't quite remember my dates, but I suspect possibly the 1980s or something. Um, and uh, gradually things uh, just kind of closed down and the whole site became abandoned. I, I don't know why these buildings weren't saved, as was often and usually the case in Victorian times, they built stuff, structures to be both functional and aesthetically pleasing to the eye. When you look at pictures of the, the mill, they're huge buildings, but there's a bit of kind of decorated brickwork going on and they try to make them as nice as possible. Even the boiler house in one of the mill buildings was nice to look at. As you can see in this uh, image here, coloured glazed tiles, shaped and what have you. You think, well, wh why do that? Who's going to look at your boiler house to see how nice it looks? That's just not going to happen. But um, as I say, the Victorians just, that's what they did. Everything was nice to look at. Um, and you know, if they had managed to save many of these mill buildings, instead of just letting them go, this could have been an absolutely stunning area. They could have used the mill buildings for housing in the same way that one of the large mills in the centre of Paisley has been now preserved and used for housing. Stunning looking structure. This whole area could have looked like that. Instead, what you've got is an area of housing, a kind of housing scheme, and no matter how expensive these houses might be, there's nothing very interesting about it at all. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, I'm Eddie Burns, take care.